The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we've been talking about this k-squared test, and um, the name k-squared comes from the fact that we build a test statistic that has a synthetic distribution uh, given by the k-squared distribution. Uh, let's just give it another shot. And uh, um, this test, who has actually ever encountered the chi-squared test outside of a stats fast room? All right, so some people have, right? It's a fairly common uh, test that you might encounter. And it was essentially to test if given some uh, data with a fixed probability mass function, right? So discrete distribution, you wanted to test if it was given, the PMF was equal to a set value, P naught, or if it was different from P naught. And the way the k-square arose here was by uh, looking at uh, Walt's test. And essentially, if you write, so Walt is the one that has the k-square as the limiting distribution. And if you invert the uh, uh, covariance matrix, the asymptotic covariance matrix, so you compute the Fisher information, which in this particular case does not exist for the multinomial distribution, but we found the trick on how to do this. We remove the part that forbid it to be invertible then we found this k-square distribution. So in a way, we have this test statistic, which you might have learned as a black box laundry list, but going through the math, which might have been slightly unpleasant, I acknowledge, but really told you why you should do this particular normalization. So uh, since some of you requested a little more uh, you know, practical examples of how those things work, let me show you a couple. Uh, the first one is, um, the, uh, you want to answer the question, well, you know, when should I be born to be successful, right? And, uh, you know, some people believe in uh, Zodiac, and so Fortune magazine actually collected the signs of 256 hazards of the Fortune 500, right? Those were taken randomly, and they were collected there, and you can see this, 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 the count of number of CEOs that have a particular Zodiac sign. And if this was completely uniformly distributed, you should actually get a number that's around 256 divided by 12, which in this case is 21.33. Okay, and you can see that there is uh, numbers that you know, are probably in the vicinity, but see, look at this guy. Pieces, right? That's 29, so whose piece is here? All right. <laughs> and um, all right, so give me your information and uh, we'll meet again in 10 years. And so uh, basically, you might want to test if actually the fact that it's uniformly distributed is a valid assumption. Now, this is clearly a random variable. I pick a random CEO and I measure uh, uh, what is um, uh, zodiac sign is. And I want to know if this, so it's a probability over, I don't know, uh, 12 zodiac signs. And I want to know if it's uniform or not, right? Uniform sounds like it should be the status quo if you're reasonable. And, uh, and maybe there's actually something that moves away. Uh, so, you know, we could uh, do this in view of this data. Is there evidence that uh, one is different? Here's an, another example where you might want to apply the chi-square test, right? So, as I said, the benchmark distribution was the uniform distribution for the zodiac sign, and that's usually the one I gave you, one over k, one over k, because, well, that's sort of the zero, uh, you know, the central point for all distributions, right? That's the point that's right at the center of what we call the simplex. Uh, but you can have another benchmark that sort of makes sense, right? So, for example, this is an actual data set where uh, 250 and 75 jurors were identified uh, with identified r uh, racial group were uh, collected, and you actually might want to know if you know juries in this country are actually representative of the actual uh, 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 population. And so here, of course, the population is not uniformly distributed. Uh, according to racial group, and the way you actually do it is you actually go on Wikipedia, for example, and you look at the demographics of the United States, and you find that the proportion of white is 72%, uh, black is 7%, Hispanic is 12 and other is, uh, 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 well, uh, about 9%, uh, um, so that's a total of one, and this is what we actually measured for uh, some jurors. So for this guy, you can actually run the chi-square test, right? You have the estimated proportion, which comes from this first line. You have the tested proportion, P0, that comes from the second line, and you might want to check if those things actually correspond to each other. 
Okay, so I'm not gonna do it for you, but I sort of invite you to do it and test and see how this compares to the quantiles of the appropriate chi-square distribution and see what you can conclude from those two things. All right, so uh, this was the multinomial case. So uh, this is essentially what we did. We computed the MLE under the right constraint and that was our test statistic that converges to the chi-square distribution. So if you've seen it before, that's all that was given to you. Now we know why the normalization here is P naught J and not P naught J squared or square root of P naught J or even one, right? I mean, it's not clear that this should be the right normalization, but we know that's what comes from taking the right normalization, which comes from the Fisher information. All right? Okay. So uh, um, the thing I wanted to move on to, so we've basically covered a uh, uh, chi-square test. Are there any questions about chi-square te chi test? And for those of you who were not here on Thursday, I'm really just, I, I do not pretend I just did it, right? That's something we did last Thursday, right? But are there any questions that arose when you were reading your notes, things that you didn't understand? Yes. So, so it's it's not the, so it's not the Fisher the Fisher information does not exist in this case, and so there's no appropriate name for this. It's the pseudo inverse of the asymptotic covariance matrix, and that's what it is. And there's um, I don't know if I mentioned it last time, but there's this entire field that uses you know for people who are really aspire to differential geometry but are stuck in a stats department. And there's this thing called information geometry, which is essentially studying the manifolds. Uh, uh, associated to the Fisher information matrix and the, uh, the, the, the metric that's associated to Fisher information, right? And so those, of course, can be lower dimensional manifolds. Uh, it not only distorts the geometry, but forces everything to live on the lower dimension, which is what happens when your Fisher information does not exist. And so, you know, there's a bunch of things that you can study what this manifold looks like, et cetera. But no, there's no particular terminology here about, uh, about going here. Uh, to be fair, within the scope of this class, this is the only case where you, multinomial case is the only case where you typically see um, uh, uh, a lack of uh, Fisher information matrix. And that's just because we have this extra constraint that the sum of the parameters should be one. And if you have an extra constraint that seems like it's actually removed one degree of freedom, this will happen inevitably. And so maybe what you can do is reparameterize. So if I actually reparameterize everything in, for, in, in function of P1 to PK minus one and then one minus the sum, this would not have happened because I have only a k-dimensional space. So there's tricks around this to make it exist if you want it to exist. Any other question? All right, so let's move on to students' t-tests. Uh, we mentioned that last time, right? So essentially uh, you've probably done it more even in, in homework than you've done it in, uh, in lectures. But just quickly, uh, this is essentially the test. That's the test when we have an actual data that comes from a normal distribution. There's no central limit theorem that exists. This is really to account for the fact that for smaller sample sizes, uh, it might be the case that it's not exactly true that when I look at xn bar minus mu divided by, so if I look at xn bar minus mu divided by sigma times square root of n, then this thing should have n0, 1 distribution approximately, right? By the central limit theorem. So that's for n large. But if n is small, then it's still true when the data is n mu sigma squared, then it's true that square root of n Here it's approximately, and this is always true. But I don't know sigma in practice, right? Maybe mu comes from my uh, maybe mu comes from my mu naught, right? Maybe something from the the test statistic where mu actually is here. But for this guy, I'm going to have inevitably to find an estimator. And now in this case, for small n, this is no longer true. And what the t statistic is doing is essentially telling you what the distribution of this guy is. All right, so the true, what you should say is that now this guy has a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. So that's basically the you know, laundry list stats that you would learn. It says just look at a different table, that's what it is. But we actually defined was a, what a T distribution was. And a T distribution 
is basically something that has the same distribution as some n01 divided by the square root of a chi squared with d degrees of freedom divided by d, and that's a t distribution with d degrees of freedom, right? And those two have to be independent. OK, and so what I need to check is that this guy over there is of this form. OK? So let's look at the numerator. Well, square root of n, xn bar minus mu. What is the distribution of this thing? Is it an n01? n0 sigma squared, right? So I'm not going to put it here. So if I want this guy to be n0, 1, I need to divide by sigma. That's what we have over there. So that's my n0, 1 that's going to play the role of this guy here. So if I want to go a little further, I need to just say, OK, now I need to have square root of n. And I need to find something here that looks like my case square root of k squared uh, divided by, yeah? No, that's just the in distribution. Uh, so I don't know. That's, uh, let's just write it like that if you want. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's not really appropriate to have. Usually you write only one distribution on the right hand side of this little thing. So not just this complicated function of distributions. I mean, this is more like to explain. OK, and so usually your thing you should say is that t is equal to this x divided by square root of z divided by d, where x has normal distribution, z has k-square distribution with d degrees of freedom, etc. OK, so what do I need here? Well, I need to have something which looks like my sigma hat, right? So somehow, inevitably, I'm going to need to have sigma hat. Now, of course, I need to divide this by my sigma so that my sigma goes away. And so now this thing here, uh, sorry, I should uh, move on to the right, OK? And so this thing here, so sigma hat is, uh, is uh, uh, square root of Sn. And now I'm almost there. So this thing is actually equal to uh, square root of n. This thing here is actually not a, uh, so this thing here follows a distribution, which is actually a chi square, square root of a chi square distribution divided by, uh, and Yeah, that's the square root uh, uh, k square distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom divided by n because sigma hat is equal to one over n sum from i equal one to n x i minus x bar squared, and we just said that this part here was a k square distribution. We didn't just say it; we said it a few lectures back that this thing was a k square distribution, and the fact that the presence of this x n bar x, x bar here was actually removing one degree of freedom from this sum. OK, so this guy here has the same distribution as a k squared n minus 1 divided by n. So now I need to actually still arrange this thing a little bit. To have a t distribution, I should not see n here, but I should see n minus 1, right? The d here is the same as this d here. And so let me make the correction so that this actually happens. Well, if I actually write this to be equal to, uh, so if I write, square root of n minus 1 as on the slide times xn bar minus mu divided by, well, let me write it as square root of sn, which is my sigma hat. Then uh, what this thing is actually equal to, well, it's, uh, it's, it follows a n0, 1 divided by the square root of my chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And here, the fact that I multiply by square root of n minus 1 and I have the square root of n here is essentially the same as dividing here by n minus 1, right? And that's my tn distribution, my t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. 
just by definition of what this thing is, okay? Yes. Uh, this guy. I'm oh, sorry. That's sigma square. Thank you. That's just that's the uh, estimator of the variance, not the estimator of the standard deviation. And when I want to divide, I divide by standard deviation. There. Thank you. Any other question or remark? The estimator for the variance, oh yes, you're right. So there's a sigma square here. Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes yeah, absolutely. And that's where it get cancels here. It gets canceled here. Okay. So this is really a sigma square times k square. Okay. So the fact that it's sigma squared is just because I can pull out sigma squared and just make those guys n zero one, right? All right, so that's my uh, t distribution. Now that I actually have a pivotal distribution, what I do is that I form the statistic. Uh, here I called it uh, t n tilde. Okay, and what is this thing? I know that this has a pivotal distribution. So for example, I know that the probability uh, that uh, T and tilde in absolute value exceeds some number uh, that I'm gonna call Q alpha over two for the T and minus one is equal to alpha, right? So that's basically, remember, the T distribution has the same shape as the Gaussian distribution. What I'm finding is for this t distribution, some number q alpha over two of t n minus one and minus q alpha over two of t n minus one. So those are different from the Gaussian one, such that the area under the curve here is alpha over two on each side, so that the probability that my absolute value exceeds this number is equal to alpha. <coughs> and that's what I'm gonna use to reject the test, right? So now my test become for H zero, say mu is equal to some mu zero versus H one, mu is not equal to mu zero, is, well, uh, re the rejection region is gonna be equal to the set on which square root of n minus one times xn bar minus mu zero this time, divided by square root of Sn exceeds in absolute value, exceeds Q, sorry, there's one already here, exceeds Q alpha over two of T n minus one. Okay, so I reject when this thing increases, the same as the Gaussian case, except that rather than reading my quintiles from the Gaussian table, I read them from the student table. It's just the same thing. So they're just gonna be a little bit farther, right? So this guy here, is just gonna be a little bigger than the one for the Gaussian one because it's gonna require me a little more evidence in my data to be able to reject because I have to account for the fluctuations of sigma hat, okay? So, of course, students' test is used everywhere. People use only t-tests, right? That's basically, if you look at any data point, any uh, 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 output, even if you had 500 observations, if you look at the statistical software output, it's gonna say t-test. And the reason why you see t-test is because sort of somehow it's felt like it's not asymptotic. You don't need to actually do, you know, to be particularly careful. And anyway, if n is equal to 500, since the two curves are above each other, it's basically the same thing. So it doesn't really change anything, so why not using the t-test? So it's not asymptotic, it doesn't require central limit theorem to, to kick in, and so in particular it can be run if you have 15 observations. Now of course the drawback of the student test is that it relies on the assumption that the 
the sample is Gaussian, and that's something we really need to keep in mind. If you have a small sample size, there's no magic going on. It's not like student t-test allows you to get rid of this asymptotic normality. It sort of assumes that it's built in. It assumes that your data has a Gaussian distribution. So if you have 15 observations, what are you going to do? You want to test if the mean is equal to zero or not equal to zero, but you have only 15 observations. You have to somehow assume that your data is Gaussian, but if the data is given to you, this is not math, you actually have to check that it's Gaussian. And so we're going to have to find tests that given some data tells us whether it's Gaussian or not. If I have 15 observations, eight of them are equal to plus one, and seven of them are equal to minus one, then it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be able to conclude that your data has a Gaussian distribution. However, if you see some sort of spread around some value, you form a histogram maybe, and it sort of looks like it's a Gaussian one, you might want to say it's Gaussian, right? And so how do we make this more quantitative? Well, the sad answer to this question is that there will be some tests that make it quantitative, but here, if you think about it for one second, what is going to be your null hypothesis? Your null hypothesis, since it's one point, it's going to be that it's Gaussian, and then it's, the alternative is going to be that it's not Gaussian. So what it means is that for the first time in your statistician's life, you're going to want to conclude that the H0 is the true one. You're definitely not going to want to say that it's not Gaussian because then everything you know is sort of falling apart. And so it's kind of a weird thing where you're sort of going to be seeking tests that have no power, basically. You're going to want tests that, and that's, what, that's the nature. The amount of alternatives, the number of ways you can be not Gaussian is so huge that all tests are sort of bound to have very low power. And so that's why people are pretty happy with the idea that things is Gaussian because it's very hard to find a test that's going to reject this hypothesis. All right? And so we're even going to find some tests that are visual where you're going to be able to say, well, you know, it sort of looks Gaussian to me. If it uh, allows, allows you to, to deal with the borderline cases pretty efficiently, we'll see actually a, a particular example. All right, so this theory of testing whether data comes from a particular distribution is called goodness of fit. Is this distribution a good fit for my data? That's the goodness of fit test. We have just seen a goodness of fit test. What was it? Yeah. The, well, the, the, um, the chi-square test, right? The chi-square test, we were given a candidate PMF and we were testing if this was a good fit for our data. That was a goodness of fit test. So of course, multinomial is one example, but really what we have in the back of our mind is I want to test if my data is Gaussian. That's basically the usual thing. And just like you always see t-test as a standard output from statistical software, whether you ask for it or not, there will be a test for normality whether you ask it or not uh, from any statistical software output. All right, so a goodness of fit test looks as follows. You're given, a, there's a random variable x and you're given IID copies of x, right? x1 to xn, they come from the same distribution and you're gonna ask the following question, that s, x have a standard normal distribution, right? So for t distribution, that's definitely the kind of questions you may wanna ask. Does x have a uniform distribution on zero, one? Right? That's different from the distribution 1 over k, 1 over k. It's the continuous new notion of, of uniform, uh, 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 uniformity. All right, and for example, you might want to test that. So there's actually a nice exercise, which is if you look at the p-values, right? So we've defined what the p-values were. And it turned, the p-value is a number between 0 and 1, right? And you could actually ask yourself, what is the distribution of the p-value under the null? Right? So it's a, the p-value is a random, uh, random number. Is the probability, right, so the p-value, let's look at a, um, the following test. H0 mu is equal to zero versus H1 mu is, say, not equal to zero. And um, I know that the p-value is, uh, so I'm going to form what? I'm going to look at xn bar minus mu divided by uh, times square root of n divided by, let's say that we know sigma for one second, right? Uh, then the p-value is the probability that this is, say, larger than square root of n, little xn bar minus mu, minus zero, actually, in this case, right? 
divided by sigma, where this guy is the observed, right? OK? So now you could say, well, how is that a random variable, right? So it's just a number. Uh, it's a, just a probability of something. But then I can view this as a function of this guy here when I plug, plug it back it <laughs> when I plug it back to be a random variable. So how, what I mean by this is that if I look at this value here, this if I look if I say that phi is the CDF of n01, right? So the p value is the probability that it exceeds this. So that's the probability that I'm on either here or here. Okay. No, it's not, right? This is a big X and this is a small X. This is just where you plug in your data. Do I have, right, the p-value is the probability that you have more evidence against your, alt your null than what you already have. Okay, so now I can write it in terms of cumulative distribution functions, right? So this is what? This is phi of this guy, which is minus this thing here. Well, it's basically two times this guy. Phi of minus square root of n xn bar divided by sigma. Right? That's the value of my p That's my p value. If you give me data, I'm going to compute the average and plug it in there, and it's going to spit out the p value. Everybody agrees? So now I can view this. If I start now looking back, I say, well, where does this data come from? Well, it, it could be a random variable. Right, it, it came from the realization of this thing. So I can try to, I can think of this value. Where now this is a random variable because I just plugged in a random variable in here. Right, so now I view my p value as a random variable. Right, so I keep on switching from small x to large x. Everybody agrees with what I'm doing here? So I just wrote it as a deterministic function of some deterministic number and now the number, it, the function stays deterministic but the number becomes random. And so now I can think of this as some statistic of my data. And I could say, well, what is the distribution of this random variable? Now, if my data is actually normally distributed, so I'm actually under the null. So under the null, that means that xn bar times square root of n divided by sigma has what distribution? Normal. Yeah, well, it was sigma. I, I assume I knew it, right? So it's n01, right? I divided by sigma here. Okay. So now I have this random variable. And uh, so my random variable is now 2 phi of minus absolute value of a Gaussian. OK? And I'm actually interested in the distribution of this thing. OK? I could ask that. Anybody has an idea of how you would want to tackle this thing? So I ask you, what is the distribution of a random variable? How do you tackle this question? There's basically two ways. One is to try to find something that looks like the expectation of h of x for all h. And you try to write this using change of variables as something that looks like integral of h of x, p of x, dx. And then you say, well, that's the density. Right? If you can write this for any h, then that's the way you would do it. But there's a much simpler way that does not involve changing uh, variables, et cetera. You just try to compute the cumulative distribution function. Right? So let's try to compute the probability that 2 phi minus n01 is less than t. And maybe we can find something we know. OK, well, that's equal to what? That's the probability that a mi minus n0, well, let's say that an n01 sorry, n01 absolute value is greater than uh, minus 
pi inverse of t over 2, right? And that's, basic, that's what? Well, it's just the same thing that we had before. It's equal to, so if I look again, this is the probability that I'm actually on this side or that side of this number. And this number is what? It's uh, minus phi of t over 2. Why do I have a minus here? Yeah, that's fine. OK. So it's actually not this. It's actually the probability that my absolute value, oh, because phi inverse, OK. Uh, because phi inverse is, uh, so I'm going to look at t between uh, 0 and, so this number is ranging between 0 and 1. So it means that this number is ranging between 0, well, the probability that something is less than t should be ranging between uh, the numbers that this guy takes to, uh, so that's between 0 and 2, right? Right, because this thing takes values between 0 and 2. I want to see 0 and 1, though. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. So this is always some number which is less than 0. So the probability that the Gaussian is less than uh, this number is always less than the probability that it's less than 0, which is 1 half. So t only has to be between 0 and 1. Thank you. And so now for t uh, less, uh, between 0 and 1, then this guy is actually becoming something which is positive for the same reason as before. And so that's what? That's just basically 2 times uh, phi of phi inverse of t over 2. Okay, That's just playing with the symmetry a little bit. You can look at the areas under the curve. And so what it means is that those two guys cancel. This is the identity. And so this is equal to t. So which distribution has a, has a density as a, sorry, which distribution has a uh, cumulative distribution function which is equal to t for t between 0 and 1? That's the uniform distribution, right? So it means that this guy follows a uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1. OK? And you can actually check that for any test you're going to come up with, this is going to be the case. Your p-value under the null will have a distribution which is uniform. So now if somebody shows up and says, here's my test, it's awesome. It just works great. I don't, I'm not going to explain to you how I built it. It's a complicated statistics that involve moments of order 27. And I'm like, OK, you know, how am I going to test that your test statistic actually makes sense? Well, one thing I can do is to run a bunch of data, draw a bunch of samples, compute your test statistic, compute the p-value, and check if my p-value has a uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1. But for that, I need to have a test that's allowed, given a bunch of observations, can tell me whether they're actually distributed uniformly on the interval 0, 1. And again, one thing I could do is build a histogram and see if it looks like that of a uniform. But I could also try to be slightly more quantitative about this. For two tests? No, it's, it's uniform under the null. Right, so because my, t my test statistic was built under the null, and so I have to be able to plug in the right value in there, otherwise it's going to shift everything for this particular test. No, but the uniform thing is a probability, so that, 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 that's, that's what makes the p-value. That's the p-value, right? That's the definition of the p-value. Right, it's the probability that my test statistic exceeds what I've actually observed. Yeah, so my, my p-value is just this number when I just plug in the values that I observe here, right? That's one number. For every data set you're going to give me, it's going to be one number. Now what I can do is for generate a bunch of data sets of size n, like 200 of them, 
And then I'm going to have a new sample of size 200, which is just the sample of 200 p-values. And I want to test if those p-values have a uniform distribution, okay? Because that's the distribution they should be having. All right? Okay. This one we've already seen. Does X have a PMF with, you know, 30%, 50%, and 20%, right? That's something I could try to test. Uh, that looks like your uh, great point distribution for this class. Uh, all right, uh, well, not exactly, but that looks like it. All right, so, uh, so all these things are, know, are known as goodness of fit test. The goodness of fit test is something that wants to know if the data that you have at hand has a, follows a hypothesized distribution, all right? So it's not a parametric test. It's not a test that says, is my mean equal to 25 or not? Is my proportion of heads larger than one half or not? It's something that says, is my distribution this particular thing? All right? So I'm going to write them as goodness of fit GOF here. So here, there's n you don't need to have parametric modeling to do that. So how do I work, right? So if I don't have any parametric modeling, I need to have something which is somewhat non-parametric, right? Something that goes beyond computing the mean and the standard deviation. Something that computes some intrinsic non-parametric aspect of my data. And just like here, we made this computation. What we did is we said, well, if I actually check that the CDF of my data has, uh, that of my p-value is uniform, then I know it's uniform. So it means that the cumulative distribution function has an intrinsic value about, it captures the entire distribution, right? Everything I need to know about my distribution is captured by the cumulative distribution function. Now, I have an empirical way of computing, I have a data-driven way of computing an estimate for the cumulative distribution function, which is using the old statistical trick, which consists in replacing expectations by averages. All right, so as I said, the, the cumulative distribution function for any distribution, we for any random variable, is, um, right, so f of t is the probability that x is less than or equal to t, which is equal to the expectation of the indicator that x is less than or equal to t, right? That's the definition of a probability. And so here I'm just going to replace expectation by the average, right? That's my usual statistical trick. And so my estimator, Fn, for uh, the distribution is going to be 1 over n, sum from i equal 1 to n of these indicators. OK? And this is called the empirical uh, CDF. It's just the data version of the CDF, OK? So I just replaced this expectation here by an average, okay? Now when I sum indicators, I'm actually counting the number of them that satisfy something. So if you look at what this guy is, this is the number of xi's that is less than t, right? And so if I divide by n, it's the proportion of observations that I have that are less than t. OK? That's what the empirical distribution. So that's what's written here, the number of, of data points that are less than t. And so this is going to be something that sort of try to estimate one or the other. And the law of large number actually tells me that for any given t, if n is large enough, fn of t, it should be close to f of t, right? Because it's an average. And this entire thing, this entire statistical trick, which consists in replacing expectations by averages, is justified by the law of large number. Every time we used it, that was because the law of large number sort of guaranteed to us that the average was close to the expectation. OK, so law of large numbers tell me that fn of t converges, so that's the strong law, says that almost surely, actually, fn of t goes to f of t. OK? And that's just for any given t. Everybody, uh, is there any question about this? Right, that averages converge to expectation. That's the law of large number. 
And almost surely, we could say in probability, it's the same that would be the weak law of large number. Now, this is fine. For any given t, the average converges to the true, right? It just happens that this random variable is indexed by t, and I could do it for t equals 1 or 2 or 25 and just check it again. But I might want to check it for all t's at once. And that's actually a different result. That's called a uniform result. I want this to hold for all t at the same time. And it may be the case that it works for each t individually, but not for all t's at the same time. What could happen is that for t equals 1, it converges at a certain rate. And for t equals 2, it converges at a bit of a slower rate. And for t equals 3, as, at a slower rate and slower rate. And so as t goes to infinity, the rate is going to vanish and nothing is going to converge. That could happen. I could make this happen at a finite point. There's many ways where I could make this happen, right? Let's see how that could work. I could say, um, well, actually, no, I still need to have this uh, at infinity for some reason. OK, so turns out that this is still true uniformly. And this is actually a much more complicated result than the law of large number. It's called glivenko cantelli theorem. And the glivenko cantelli theorem tells me that for all t's at once, fn converges to f. OK, so let me just tell you, show you quickly why this is just a little bit stronger than the one that we, we had. So remember, uh, if soup is confusing you, think of max. It's just a max over an infinite set. And so what we know is that fn of t minus goes to f of t as n goes to infinity. And let's say almost surely. OK, and that's the law of large numbers, which is equivalent to saying that fn of t minus f of t as n goes to infinity converges almost surely to 0, right? This is the same thing. Now, I want this to happen for all t's at once, OK? And so what I'm going to do, oh, and this is actually equivalent to this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a little stronger. So th here the arrow only goes one way. And this is where the soup for t in R of fn of t OK? And you can actually show that this happens also almost surely. OK? Now, maybe almost surely is a bit more difficult to get a grasp on. Does, can somebody, does somebody have, would let, can, does anybody want to see a, 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 like why this statement for the soup is strictly stronger than the one that holds individually for all t? You want to see that? OK, so let's do this. So forget about almost surely for one second. Let's just do it for improbability. Right? The fact that fn of t converges to f, f, f of t for all t in probability means that this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity for any epsilon, right? For any epsilon nt, we know we have this. That's the convergence in probability. Now what I want is to put a soup here. Right? But the probability that the soup is larger than epsilon might be actually always larger than, uh, never go to, to 0 in some cases, right? It could be the case that for each given t, I can make n large enough so that this is small, uh, so that this probability becomes small. But then maybe it's an n of t, right? So this here means that for any, say, uh, maybe I shouldn't put the, let me put the delta here. So for any epsilon, so for any t, there, and for any epsilon, there exists n, which could depend on, the, on both epsilon and t, such that the probability that f n t minus f of t exceeding uh, delta is less than epsilon t. Well, there exists an n and a delta. No, that's for all delta, sorry. So uh, right, so this is true, right? So that's, that's what the, this limit statement actually means. But it could be the case that now when I take the soup over t, maybe that n of t is something that looks like t. Or maybe, well, 
integer part of t. It could be, right? I don't say anything. It's just an n that depends on t. So if this n is just t, maybe t over epsilon, right? Because I want epsilon, something like this. Well, that means that if I want this to hold for all t's at once, I'm going to have to go for the, t, the n that works for all t's at once. But there's no such n that works for all t's at once. This is the only n that works is infinity. And so I cannot make this happen for all of them. What Glivenko can tell, he tells you, it's actually this is not something that holds like this. That the n that depends on t, there's actually one largest n that works for all the t's at once. And that's it. OK, so just so you know why this is actually a stronger statement, and, uh, and uh, uh, that's basically how, how it works. Any other question? Yeah. So what is the justification for this statement? Is it the random variable has a finite mean and a finite variance? No. Well, the random variable does have finite mean and finite variance because the random variable is an indicator. So it has everything you want. This is one of the nicest random variables. This is a Burnley random variable. Right, so here when I say law of large number, uh, that this whole, uh, where did I write this? I think I erased it. Yeah, the one over there, this is actually law of large numbers for Bernoulli random variables. They have everything you want. They're bounded. Yes? So you mean this one? Yeah. For all epsilon and all t? Yeah. So you fix them now. Then the probability that I, ex oh, sorry, uh, that was delta, right? I changed uh, this epsilon to delta at some point. Okay. Um, and then what's the second line? Oh, so then the second line says that for all, so this is, so the way you, so this, I'm just rewriting in terms of epsilon delta what this n goes, uh, goes to infinity means. So that means that for any, uh, well, for any t and, and uh, delta, right? So that's the same as this guy here. Then here, I'm just going back to rewriting this. It says that for any epsilon, there exists an n large enough, yeah. uh, such that, well, n larger than this thing, basically, such that uh, this thing is less than epsilon. Okay. So Glivenko can tell, he tells us that not only is this thing is a good idea point-wise, but it's also a good idea uniformly. And all it's saying is, if you actually were happy with just this result, you should be even happier with that result. And this, both of these results only tell you one thing. They're just telling you that the empirical CDF is a good estimator of the CDF. OK. Now, since those, F, th those indicators are Bernoulli distributions, I can actually do even more. So let me get this guy here. OK. So those guys, uh, fn of t, this guy is a Bernoulli distribution. What is the parameter of this Bernoulli distribution? What is the probability that it takes value 1? f of t, right? It's just the probability that this thing happens, which is f of t. So in particular, the variance of this guy is the variance of this Bernoulli. So it's f of t, 1 minus f of t. And I can use that in my central limit theorem. And my name, central limit theorem is just going to tell me that if I look at the average of random variables, I remove their mean, right? So I look at square root of n fn of t, which I could really write as xn bar, right? That's really just an xn bar, minus the expectation, which is f of t. That comes from this guy. Now, if I divide by square root of the variance, that's my square root p1 minus p, then this guy, by the central limit theorem, goes to some n01, OK? which is the same thing as you see there, except that the variance was put on the other side. OK, do I have the same thing uniformly in t? Right? Can I write something that holds uniformly in t? Well, if you think about it for one second, it's unlikely it's going to go too well. 
in the sense that it's unlikely that the supremum of those random variables over t is going to also be a Gaussian. Right? And the reason is that, uh, well, actually, the reason is that this thing is actually a stochastic process indexed by t. A stochastic process is just a sequence of random variables that's indexed by, say, time. One, the one that's the most famous is the Brown, Brown and motion, and it's basically a bunch of Gaussian increments, right? So when you go from t to just t a little after that, you have just add some Gaussian to the thing. And, uh, and uh, here, it's basically the same thing that's happening. And you would sort of expect, since each of this guy is Gaussian, you would expect to see something that looks like a Brownian motion at the end. But it's not exactly a Brownian motion. It's something that's called a Brownian bridge. So if you've seen the Brownian motion, it's something, if I make it start at 0, for example, so this is the value of my Brownian motion. Let's write it. Uh, so this is one path, one realization of a Brownian motion. Let's call it W of t as t increases. So it's, let's say it starts at 0, and it looks like something like this. Right? So that's what brown motion looks like. It's just something that's pretty nasty. And, uh, but it, it's, I mean, it looks pretty nasty. It's not continuous, et cetera, but it's actually very, um, very benign uh, in some average way. OK, and so brown motion is just something what you should view this as if I sum some uh, random variable. Uh, that are Gaussian, and then I look at, at this farther and from farther and farther, it's going to look like this. And so here, I cannot have a brown motion in the end, because what is the value at, what is the variance of fn of t minus f of t at t is equal to 1? Sorry, at t is equal to infinity. It's 0, right? The variance goes from 0 at t is negative infinity, because at negative infinity, f of t is going to 0. And at f of, at t, as t goes to plus infinity, f of t is going to 1, which means that the variance of this guy as t goes from negative infinity to plus infinity is penned to be 0 on each side. And so my Brownian motion cannot, so right when I describe a Brownian motion, I'm just like adding more and more entropy to the thing, and it's going all over the place. But here, what I want is that as I go back, it should go back to essentially 0. It should be penned down to a specific value at the end. And that's actually called the Brownian bridge. It's a Brown motion that's conditioned to come back to where it started, essentially. Now, you don't need to understand Brownian bridges to understand what I'm going to be telling you. What, the only thing I want to communicate to you is that this guy here, when I say a Brownian bridge, I can go to any probabilist, and they can tell you all the probability uh, 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 properties of this stochastic process. It can tell me the probability it takes any value at any point. In particular, it can tell me the supremum between 0 and 1 of this guy. It can tell me what the cumulative distribution function of this thing is. It can tell me what the density of this thing is. It can tell me everything. So it means that if I want to compute probabilities on this object here, which is the maximum value that this guy can take over a certain period of time, which is basically this random variable, right? So if I look at the value here, it's a random variable that fluctuates. It can tell me where it is with high probability. It can tell me the quintiles of this thing, and it tell, can tell me, which is useful because I can build a table and use it to compute my quintiles and form tests. Right? OK? So that's what actually is quite nice. It says that if I look at the square root of n f n hat, now I soup over t, I get something that looks like the soup of this Gaussians, but it's not really soup of Gaussian. It's soup of a brown motion. Now, there's something you should be very careful here. I cheated a little bit. I, mean, I didn't cheat. I can do whatever I want. But my notation might be a little confusing. Everybody sees that this t here is not the same as this t here. Can somebody see that, right? Just because, first of all, this guy is between 0 and 1, and this guy is between is all in all of R. What is this t here as a function of this t here? This guy is f of this guy, OK? So really. If I wanted to be completely transparent and not, you know, save the keys of my keyboard, I would write this as right, soup over t of f n t minus f of t goes to, in distribution, as n goes to infinity, the supremum 
over t, again in R, so this guy is for t in the entire real line, this guy is for t in the entire real line, but now I should write b of what? f of t, exactly. So really the t here is f of the uh, original one, and so that's the Brownian motion, that's the Brownian bridge where when t goes to infinity, the Brownian bridge goes from zero to one and it looks like this. The Brownian bridge at zero is zero, at one is zero, and it does this, but it doesn't stray too far because I condition it to come back to this point. That's what a Brownian bridge is. Okay. So in particular, I can find uh, a distribution for this guy. And I can use this to build a test which is called the kolmogorov smirnov test. Okay, so the idea is the following. It says, well, if I, were if I want to test some distribution f not, some distribution that has a particular CDF f not, and I plug it in under the null, then this guy should have pretty much the same distribution as this supremum of Brown and Bridge. And so if I see this to be much larger than it should be when it's the supremum of Brown and Bridge, I'm actually going to reject my hypothesis. Okay? So here's the test. I want to test whether H0 f is equal to f0, and you will see that most of the, the um, goodness of fit tests are formulated mathematically in terms of the cumulative distribution function. I could formulate them in terms of probability density function or just write x follows n0, 1, but that's the way we write it. We formulate them in terms of cumulative distribution function because that's what we have a handle on through the empirical cumulative distribution function. Okay, and then it's versus H1, F is not equal to F0. Okay, so now I have my empirical CDF, and I hope that for all T's, Fn of T should be close to F0 of T. Uh, okay, let me write it like this. I put it to, uh, on the exponent because uh, otherwise that would be I have F, the empirical distribution function based on zero observation. All right, so uh, now I form the following test statistic. Okay, so my test statistic is Tn, which is the supremum over T in the real line of square root of n, Fn of T minus F of T, uh, sorry, F0 of T, so I can compute everything. I know this from the data, and this is the one that comes from my uh, null hypothesis. I can compute this thing, and I know that if this is true, this should actually be the supremum of a Brown and Bridge, pretty much, okay? And so, the kolmogorov smirnov test is simply reject if this guy, Tn, in absolute value, right? This, uh, no, actually not in absolute value. This is just already absolute valued. Then this guy should be what? Well, it should be larger than the Q alpha over two distribution that I have, but now rather than putting n01 or tn, this is here, whatever notation I have for supremum of Brownian bridge. Okay? Just like I did for any pivotal distribution, right? That was the same recipe every single time. I formed the test statistic such that the asymptotic distribution did not depend on anything I know, and then I would just reject when this pivotal distribution was larger than something. Yes? Do you know what a Brown and Bridge is? Or? So it's the only basis. Okay, so this thing here is, think of it as being a Gaussian, right? So for all T, you have a Gaussian distribution. Okay, now a Brownian motion so if I so if I had a Brownian motion, I need to tell you what the so it's basically a brown motion is something that looks like this. It's some random variable that's indexed by t. I won't say the expectation of x t to be equal to zero for all t. okay, and what I want is that the increments have a certain distribution, okay, so what I want is that um, 
the expectation of x t minus x s follows some distribution which is n zero t minus s. Okay, so the increments are bigger as I go farther in terms of uh, variability. And I also want some covariance structure between the two, right? So what I want is that the covariance between x s and x t is actually equal to the minimum of s and t. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, that should be that. Okay, so this is, you know, you open a probability book, that's what it's gonna look like. So in particular, you can see if I put zero here, as t goes to, inf and x zero is equal to zero, it has zero variance and it's, so in particular, it means that x t, if I look only at the teeth one, it has some normal distribution with variance t. So this is something that just blows up. So this guy here, it looks like it's gonna be a brown motion because when I look at the left-hand side, it has a normal distribution. Now there's a bunch of other things you need to check. Is the fact that you have this covariance, for example, which I did not tell you. But it should look somewhat, somewhat like that. And in particular, when I look at the uh, normal with mean zero and, and variance here, then it's clear that this guy does not have a variance that's gonna go to infinity just like the variance of this guy. We know that the variance is, is forced to be back to zero. Okay, and so in particular, we have something that has mean zero always, whose variance has to be zero at zero, and uh, variance, uh, sorry, at t equals negative infinity, and variance one at t equals plus infinity, sorry, variance zero at t equals plus infinity, and so I have to basically force it to be equal to zero on, at each end. So the brown motion here tends to just go to infinity somewhere, Whereas this guy, I force it to come back. Now, everything I described to you is on the scale zero, negative infinity to plus infinity, but since everything depends of, on f of t, I can actually just put that back into a scale, which is zero and one by a, a simple change of variable. And it's like, it's called change of time for the Brown motion. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that definitely it's gonna be, I mean, it, by symmetry, you can probably infer all the things, right? So. Just so I can imagine if I'm in a security room and it's like dark at zero and it's space, like the space for the layers of security is really, really long. Like, really yeah, so I don't know exactly, there's an explicit formula for this and it's simple. That's what I can tell you, but I don't know what the explicit, I, uh, at the top of my head, what the explicit formula is. But would it have to match the scale of that? Yeah. Or is it back at a zero? No, uh, uh, well, the brown and bridge, this is the supreme of, you're right. So this is, yeah, so right. So this will be this form for the variance for sure, because this is only marginal distribution that don't take, right? The process is not just what is the distribution at each instant t, it's also how do those distributions interact with each other, right? In terms of covariance. But for the marginal distributions at each instant t, you're right, the variance is f of t one minus f of t. That's not gonna, we're not gonna escape that. Uh, but then the covariance structure between those guys is a little more complicated, but yes, you're right. For marginal, that's enough. Yeah, it could be infinity. So, so like, so like if you just talked about your variance has to be zero, so why are we doing all the weird things that we're doing here? Um, okay, because uh, what I, did I erase it? Yeah, because here I didn't say the supremum of the absolute value of a brown and bridge, I just said the supremum of a brown and bridge, but you're right, let's just do this like that. And then, uh, and then it's uh, it's probably cleaner, right? So yeah, actually, I, well, that should be Q alpha. So uh, uh, this is basically you're right. So this is think of it as being one-sided, uh, and th there's actually no symmetry for the supremum, right? So I mean, the supremum is not symmetric around zero, and so uh, so you're right. I should not use alpha over two. Thank you. Any other question? That should be alpha. Uh, yeah. I mean, those slides were written with I minus alpha and I have not replaced all instances of one minus alpha by alpha. 
I mean, except this guy is still the, well, it uh, depends on how you want to call it, but this is still the probability that z, the probability that z exceeds this guy should be alpha, okay? And this can be found in tables, and we can compute the p-value just like we did before. But we have to simulate it because it's not gonna depend on the cumulative distribution function of a Gaussian like it did for the usual Gaussian test. It's something that's more complicated, and typically you don't even try, you get the statistical software to do it for you. Okay, so just uh, uh, let, me, let me skip a few lines. This is what the table looks like for the kolmogorov smirnov test. Okay, so it just tells you what is your number of observations n, then you want alpha to be equal to 5%, say, let's say you have nine observations. So if square root of n absolute value of fn of t minus f of t exceeds this thing, you reject, okay? So, What's pretty clear from this test is that it looks very nice and I tell you this is how you build it, but if you think about it for one second, it's actually really an annoying thing to build because you have to take the supremum over t, right? This depends on computing a supremum, which you know, in practice might be super cumbersome. I don't want to have to compute this for all values t and then just take the maximum of those guys. It turns out that it's actually quite nice that we don't have to actually do this. What does the empirical distribution function look like? Well, this thing, remember, fn of t, by definition was, so let me go to the slide that's relevant. So fn of t looks like this. So what it means is that when t is between two observations, then this guy is actually keeping the same value. So if I put my observations on the real line here, so let's say I have one observation here, one observation here, one observation here, one observation here, and one observation here for simplicity, then this guy is basically up to this normalization counting how many observations I have that are less than t, right? So since I normalize by n, I know that the smallest number here is gonna be zero, and the largest number here is gonna be one. Okay, so let's say this looks like this. This is the value one, okay? At the value, since I take a less than or equal to, when I'm at xi, I'm actually counting it. So the jump happens at xi. So that's the first observation. And then I jump, by how much do I jump? Yeah, one over n, right? Okay, and then this value belongs to, uh, to the right. And then I do it again. I'm gonna, I, I know I'm not, it's not gonna work out for me, but we'll see. Uh, that's, oh no, actually I did pretty well. Uh, okay, this is what my cumulative distribution looks like. Now if you look on this slide, there's this weird notation where I start putting now my indices in parentheses, x parentheses one, x parentheses two, et cetera. Those are called the ordered statistic. It's just because it might be you know, when my data is given to me, I just call the first observation the one that's on top of the table, but it doesn't have to be the smallest value. So it might be that this is x1 and that this is x2, then this is x3, x4, and x5, right? This might be my observations. So what I do is that I recall them in such a way that this is actually, I recall this guy, x1, which is just really x3. Uh, this is x2, x3, x4, and x5. These are my reordered observations in such a way that the smallest one is indexed by one and the largest one is indexed by n. Okay? So now, this is actually quite nice because what I'm trying to do is to find the largest deviation from this guy to the true cumulative distribution function. The true cumulative distribution function, let's say it's Gaussian, looks like this. Right, so something continuous for a symmetric distribution, it crosses this axis at one half, and that's what it looks like. And the cumulative, the, the kolmogorov smirnov test is just telling me how far do I get those two curves get in the worst possible case, right? So in particular here, where are they the farthest? Clearly that's this point. And so up to rescaling, this is the value I'm gonna be interested in.
That's how they get as far as possible from each other. Here, something just happened, right? The farthest distance that I got was exactly at one of those dots. It turns out this is enough to look at those dots. And the reason is, well, because after this dot and until the next jump, this guy does not change, but this guy increases. And so the, the only point where they can be the farthest apart is either to the, left at, at one, to the left of a jump or to the right of a jump. That's the only place where they can be far from each other. And that means that only one observation. Everybody sees that? The farthest points, the points at which those two curves are the farthest from each other has to be at one of the observations. And so rather than looking at a soup over all possible t's, really all I need to do is to look at a maximum only at my observations. Right, I just need to check at each of those points whether they're far. Now here, notice that you did not, this is not written fn of xi. The reason is because I actually know what fn of xi is. fn of the ith order observation is just the number of jumps I've had until this observation. So here, I know that the value of fn is one over n. Here it's two over n, three over n, four over n, five over n. So I know that the values of fn at my observations and those are actually the only values that fn can take, are an integer divided by n. And that's why you see i minus one over n or i over n. This is the difference just before the jump and this is the difference at the jump. Okay? So here, the key message is that this is no longer a supremum over all t's but it's just a maximum from one to n. So I really have only two n values to compute this value and this value for each observation, that's 2n total. I look at the maximum and that's actually the value. And it's actually equal to tn. Those are things, it's not an approximation, those things are equal. That's just the only places where those guys can be maximum. Okay? Yes? Oh, it's strictly less powerful. Strictly less powerful. So you have the value of this is one over n squared over n, or this is the ratio of this is one over n squared over n, and then this is the value of this is one over n squared over n. And then you have the ratio of this is one over n squared over n, right? So, so can you, I'm, I'm not sure what question you're asking. So Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so remember, here in this test we want to conclude to H0, in the other test we typically want to conclude to H1. So here we actually don't want power in a way. And, uh, and you have to also assume that Doing a test on the mean is probably not the only thing you're gonna end up doing on your data after, after you actually establish that it's normally distributed. Then you have a data set, you've sort of established it's normally distributed and then you can just run the arsenal of statistical studies and we're gonna see regression and all sorts of predict predictive things which are not just, just test if the mean is equal to something. Maybe you wanna build a confidence interval for the mean, then this is not a, t the confidence interval is not a test, right? So you're gonna have to first test if it's normal and then see if you can actually use the quantiles of a Gaussian distribution or a T distribution to build this uh, uh, confidence interval. So in a way, you could, should do this as like, you know, the flat fee to enter the Gaussian world and then you can do whatever you wanna do in the Gaussian world. Um, we'll see actually that your question goes back to something that's a little more, that's a little important is here I said, F0 is fully specified, right? It's like an N15. But I didn't say, is it, Gauss, is it normally distributed? Which is the question that everybody asks, right? You're not asking, is it this particular normal distribution with this particular mean and this particular variance? So how would you do it in practice? Well, you would say, I'm just gonna replace the mean by the empirical mean and the variance by the empirical variance. But by doing that, you're making a huge mistake because you're sort of 
depriving your test of the possibility to reject the Gaussian hypothesis just based on the fact that the mean is wrong or the variance is wrong. You've already stuck to your data pretty well, okay? And so you're sort of like already, you know, tilting the game in favor of a zero big time. So there's actually a way to arrange for this. Uh, okay, so this is about pivotal statistic. We've used this word many times. Uh, um, and uh, okay, so that's how, I'm not gonna go into this test. It's really, this is a recipe on how you would actually build the, the table that I showed you, right? This table, this is basically the recipe on how to build it. There's another recipe to build it, which is just open a book at this page, right? That's a little <laughs> faster. Uh, or use the software. Um, I just wanted to sh show you, so let's just keep in mind, anybody has a good memory, let's just keep in mind this number. This is the, the, uh, the, the threshold for the uh, Kolmogorov's mirror statistic if I have 10 observations and I want to do it at 5%, okay? It's about 41%. So that's the number that it should be uh, larger from. So it turns out that if you want to test if it's normal and not just a specific normal, this number is gonna be different. Do you think the number I'm gonna read in a table that's appropriate for this is gonna be larger or smaller? Who says larger? So the question is, this is the number I should see if my test was, is x, uh, say, n0, 5, right? That's a specific distribution with a specific f0, right? So that's the number, that's, I would build the kolmogorov smirnov statistic from this. I would perform a test and check if my kolmogorov smirnov statistic tn is larger than this number or not. Okay, if it's larger, I'm gonna reject. Now I say, Actually, I don't want to test if H0 is N05, but it's just N mu sigma squared for some mu and sigma squared. And in particular, I'm just going to plug in mu hat and sigma hat into my F0, run the same statistic, but compare it to a different number. Should this, so the larger the number, the more or less likely I am, I am to reject. The less likely I am to reject, right? So. If I just use that number, I would, let's say this is the, a large number, I would be more tempted to say it's Gaussian. Now if you look at the table you would get if you make the appropriate correction at the same number of observations, 10 and the same level, you get 25% as opposed to 41%. That means that you're actually much more likely if you use the appropriate test to reject the fact that it's normal, which is bad news because that means you don't have access to the Gaussian arsenal and nobody wants to do this. So actually, this is a mistake that people do a lot. They use the kolmogorov smirnov test to test for normality without adjusting for the fact that they've plugged in the estimated mean and the estimated variance. This leads to rejecting less often, right? I mean, this is almost half of the number that we had and then there can be happy and walk home and say, well, I did the test and it was normal. So this is actually a, a mistake that I believe that genuinely at least a quarter of the people do make in purpose. They say, well, I wanted it to be Gaussian, so I'm just gonna make my life easier. All right, so uh, this is the so-called Kolmogorov leader force test. We'll talk about it, well, not today for sure. Um, there's other uh, statistics that you can test, that you can use, and the idea is to say, well, we want to know if the empirical distribution function, the empirical CDF, is close to the true CDF. The way we did it is by forming the difference and looking at the worst possible distance they can be. That's called the soup norm or L infinity norm in, the, in the functional analysis. So here, this is what it looked like, right? The distance between Fn and F that we measured was just the supremum distance over all Ts. That's one way to measure distance between two functions. But there's an infinite way, many ways to measure distance between functions. One is something we're much more familiar with, which is the squared L2 norm. This is nice because this has like a inner, inner product, it has some nice properties, and you could actually just, rather than t taking the soup, you could just integrate the squared distance. And this is what leads to Kramer and Mises test. And then there's another one that says, well, Maybe I don't want to integrate without weights. Maybe I want to put weights that account for the variance. And this guy is called Anderson Darling. For each of these tests, you can check that the asymptotic distribution is going to be pivotal, which means that there will be a table at the back of some book that tells you what the uh, uh, statistic, the, the quantiles of square root of n times this guy are asymptotically, basically. Yeah? 
Yeah. Right? So, but I thought we were still handling Yeah. So that's just to show you that asymptotically it's pivotal, and I can point you to one spe specific thing. But it turns out that this thing is actually pivotal for each n. And that's why you have this recipe to construct the entire thing, because it's actually not true for all possible n's. Also, there's the n that shows up here. So um, no, actually, this is something you should have in mind. OK, so basically, uh, let me, let me uh, strike what I just said. This thing you can actually, this distribution will not depend on f0 for any particular n. It's just not going to be a Brownian bridge, but a finite sample approximation of a Brownian bridge. And you can simulate that just drawing samples from it, building a histogram, and constructing the, the quintiles to this guy. Oh, there is one. That's the table, right? Uh, maybe uh, let's see if we see it at the bottom of the other table. Yeah, see, over 40, over 30. So this is not the Kolmogorov Smirnov, but that's the Kolmogorov Lily Force. Those numbers that you see here, they're in the numbers for the asymptotic thing, which is some sort of Brownian bridge. Yeah. So then you won't have this nice picture, right? This can happen at any point because you're going to have discontinuities in F, and those things can happen everywhere. And then, or? oh, you mean the Brown Bridge? No, 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 but you still need it. You still need it for, so there's, there's some finite sample versions of it that you can use that are slightly more conservative, so which is in way, way of good news because you're going to conclude more to H0. And there's some, you know, I uh, forget the name, it's uh, uh, Kiefer Wolfowitz, uh, Kiefer Voretsky Wolfowitz inequality, which is basically like Hopkins inequality. So it's basically up to bad constants telling you the same result as the Brown and Bridge result. And those are true all the time. Uh, but for the exact dis asymptotic distribution, you need continuity, yes. Yes? So, like, if you have a continuity, Well, if you know what they are, you can use Kolmogorov Smirnov. But if you don't know what they are, you're going to plug in, as soon as you're going to estimate the mean and the variance from the data, you're going to, you should use the one we'll see next time, which is called Kolmogorov Lily Force. Don't have to think about it too much. We'll talk about it on Thursday. Any other question? So we're out of time, so uh, I think uh, we should stop here, and we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll resume on Thursday.